to stop a speeding train in its tracks and make off with millions. The planning had to be perfect. It became the crime by which all others would be measured. In the early morning hours of August 8, 1963, a Royal Mail train made its run from Glasgow to London. Fireman David Whitby and engineer Jack Mills traveled this route nightly. Postal workers routinely sorted and organized the mail during the run. Although it wasn't public knowledge, sometimes these trains also carried huge deposits from outlying banks. This particular consignment was especially large because of the August bank holiday. Security was light. And why not? Trains on this line had made this trip for years without incident. But a daring gang of thieves was about to change all that. The plan was ingenious. They chose a desolate stretch of track two hours outside London and cut all communication with the outside world. Stopping a train traveling at 70 miles an hour was their biggest challenge. Using battery power, they made the red light burn twice as bright as usual. Then the gang waited. Upon seeing the red signal light, engineer Jack Mills quickly stopped the train. Mills sent his fireman, David Whitby, to the trackside telephone to find out what was going on. Whitby had made this run numerous times without mishap. So even when he found the cut wires, he didn't immediately anticipate the danger that awaited him. until it was too late. Whitby was told if he shouted, they would kill him. The thieves made certain Engineer Mills would cooperate. Occasionally, the train did stop during its run, so none of the postal workers inside suspected anything. Every detail of the robbery had been planned with military precision. While some of the gang members secured the engine, others were assigned to separate the first car from the rest of the train. This was the high value coach and contained what the thieves were looking for. A mile down the track, Mills was ordered to stop the train where the other gang members were waiting. They didn't waste any time. The postal workers inside were caught completely off guard. Before they could even comprehend what was happening, the thieves had broken into the coach. The gang then brought the poster workers forward to the engine compartment and handcuffed them along with Mills and Whitby, who were already secured. They were about to make off with the biggest haul ever taken from a British railroad over 7.3 million dollars. It was a brilliant crime because of the planning, because of the business of stopping the train at one point, cutting off the guard, take away the engine and two carriages. It was superbly planned. Oh, no, no. 
it took the thieves only 15 minutes to completely empty the contents of the high-value coach. 124 sacks filled with money en route from northern banks to their London counterparts. Then, the thieves drove off in Land Rovers painted like military vehicles, hoping that anyone who saw them would believe they were soldiers on nighttime maneuvers. The robbery had gone according to plan. Now, their escape would have to be just as masterfully executed if they were to stay ahead of the law. Down the track, a signalman wondered why the engine had been uncoupled. Running to the scene of the crime, he quickly got his answer. Engineer Mills immediately sent him to get help. The gang had planned the heist to take place in a remote location. The nearest farmhouse was over 30 minutes away by foot. The delay gave the gang time to escape. Now they've got the VHF open, listening for police transmissions, and there's nothing, not a sign of anything. And they think, uh-uh, they've blanked it, they've put a silence on, and suddenly, they hear the police come in, and they hear the wonderful message. I'm not gonna believe this, but they've stolen a train. You'll never believe this. They've just stolen a train. A 30-minute head start was all they needed. At an abandoned farm called Leatherslade, they planned to lie low until the search cooled. Racing against the dawn, they unloaded the money into the house and hid the Land Rovers in buildings out back. A professional robber, a professional thief, has three great rewards. There's the intellectual reward, planning, working out how to do it. They have minds and they like using them. There's the adrenaline rush of going in. Now we're doing it. Now we're breaking into somebody's property. Now we're going for it. And there's the gambler's thrill of what have we got? How much have we got? Now for the train robbery, you have expert and brilliant planning. You have the excitement of a 50 minute drive through back lanes, waiting for the train. It's come, we're in, we've got it. And then when they get back, was there as much money as they hoped? Two and a half million pounds in used notes, more than anybody's ever had before. They got the rewards. The gang consisted of experienced members from London's underworld, but even these KG thieves were in awe of the amount they had taken. It took an entire day to count and divvy up the score. Each man would walk away with the hefty sum of 150,000 pounds, over three quarters of a million in today's dollars. One man, Ronald Biggs, could hardly believe his luck. He was a petty crook, but had managed to use his charm and charisma to make connections with more accomplished criminals. He had met Bruce Reynolds, the gang's ringleader, in prison. When Reynolds realized Biggs had a connection at the railroad, it was a match made in heaven. The local police and Scotland Yard detectives immediately came to the scene of the crime. The police scoured the scene for clues and they quickly ascertained that the bandits were no amateurs. They had not only succeeded in stopping a train, they had also vanished without a clue. At the train, the robbers made one mistake. They shouted to the postal workers, don't move for half an hour, we've got someone watching you. Now the police had nothing to go on except this shout. And Superintendent MacArthur said, wait a minute, that may mean they're somewhere which is half an hour's distance away. Draw a radius of 30 miles round the bridge and let's search every farm in that radius. Detective Jack Slipper, part of the team assigned to the case, remembers how that simple clue focused the initial search. Well, that became very important to us because the senior people at the yard when they'd been called in 
realised that they couldn't have got back to London in 20 minutes. Scotland Yard enlisted local law enforcement and the army to conduct the search of the surrounding countryside. Local citizens were stopped and asked if they had seen anything that evening. The plan was to lie low for at least four days at the farm. Each man took a turn at keeping watch and they carefully monitored the police radio to follow the progress of the search. When they heard over the radio that the army were being called in to search every building in a radius of 20 or 25 miles, all the barns and outhouses and everything, uh, they, or well, some of them, panicked. The robbers decided to move out immediately. They slipped away a few at a time so as not to raise suspicion. Scotland Yard detectives knew time was of the essence. They had to find the gang before they left the country. They sent plainclothesmen to scour the underworld for any tips. And they also continued to focus on the surrounding countryside where the crime took place. Surely someone saw something that night. But the gang members had slipped through their fingers, making it back to London and concealing themselves in the city. ...of Detective Superintendent MacArthur, today has been a working day. At Scotland Yard, telephone back to Buckingham. Yeah. Buckingham. Ronald Biggs was one of the gang members who headed back to London. After the heist, he simply returned to his family, went back to his job as a carpenter, and acted as if nothing had happened. Biggs was a known ex-criminal in London at the time of the great train robbery. He had a lot of form, but he hadn't actually committed any crimes for four years. He was setting himself up reasonably successfully as a builder, but he did need more capital to keep his business going. Biggs now had all the money he had ever dreamed of, and then some, but spending it would tip off the police. Turning to his connections in the underworld, Big split up his take and gave it to friends for safekeeping. Five days after the robbery, a neighboring farmer became suspicious when he noticed black curtains in the windows of the farmhouse. Upon closer inspection, he found one of the Land Rovers. He knew the farm had been uninhabited for some time, so he immediately contacted the police. The thieves had planned to have an associate clean the hideout and remove any evidence that would implicate them. But before he could get there, the police were scouring the property for clues. The fingerprint experts went in and covered everything. And then they found fingerprints on the ketchup bottle, fingerprints on the sources of milk put out for the cat, fingerprints on the Monopoly money, fingerprints on the salt cellar, fingerprints on one of the wrappers that the banknotes had been in. They also found empty mailbags in a hole in the front yard, but only 684 pounds sterling in very used notes were recovered. The police had secured an abundance of evidence. It would take time to analyze the fingerprints and match them to known criminals. Attempting to sequester their money, two of the thieves hid their stash in a truck and traveled outside London to find a garage for rent. They offered the landlady three months cash in advance. While the men were still there, she phoned the police. The robbers had unluckily called upon a policeman's widow. She was instantly suspicious when the men pulled out the large amount of cash. When the police asked them for identification, the men fled. The officers inspected the truck and found over 140,000 pounds in banknotes. 
In London, Ronald Biggs kept his eye on the news, but it didn't faze him that their hideout had been discovered. He was confident that he had left nothing behind that could link him to the crime. At Scotland Yard, after weeks of poring over the evidence, detectives were narrowing their list of suspects. When they examined the fingerprints from the Leather Slade farm, they discovered that the prints matched several ex-cons in and around London. One of them was Ronald Biggs. Scotland Yard traced Ronald Biggs because he'd left a fingerprint on a ketchup bottle. Mm -hmm. They quickly descended upon his apartment, right but Biggs wasn't at home. His wife attempted to reach him at work, but police feared that she would tip him off. The wily Biggs had so far managed to elude Scotland Yard, but now they were about to catch up to him. When Ronald Biggs got home from work that evening, he was surprised to find Scotland Yard detectives waiting for him at his flat. With each day that had passed since the robbery, he had grown more confident that he was in the clear. The police tried to get Biggs to implicate other gang members, but he refused. However, the evidence collected at Leatherslade Farm was enough for police to arrest the majority of the gang members. Charles Wilson's fingerprints were found at the farm, and he was arrested. James Hussey's prints were also found, and he was brought up on charges for buying the getaway vehicles. Prince implicated Roy the Weasel James, and after a dramatic rooftop chase, he was arrested. John Weeter, a solicitor who had helped the gang find and use Leatherslade Farm, was arrested for conspiracy, as was Leonard Field, who had pretended to be interested in purchasing the farm. A German hotel bill found in one stash of confiscated money led to the arrest of Brian Field. Fourteen people were rounded up in the initial sweep, but police were only able to recover 300,000 of the two and a half million pounds stolen. Fingerprints on the Monopoly set implicated Bruce Reynolds, yet he proved to be one of the most difficult to arrest. The man who had masterfully planned the great train robbery had also set up an elaborate escape. Using a false passport, he left England for France and vanished. England was captivated by the great train robbery. For weeks, the arrests and the trials were all over the news. The gang had become media sensations, but when the sentences were handed down, people were stunned. Ronald Biggs was sentenced to 30 years, but that wasn't the end of his story. He wasn't about to spend the rest of his life in jail. After his conviction, Biggs was sent to Wandsworth Prison, where he was classified a special watch prisoner. Two guards sat outside his cell at all times, but this did not deter his plan for escape. He had recruited a fellow inmate, Paul Seaborn, who was about to be released. Seaborn would use the train robbery money to make arrangements on the outside. Because Biggs was about to be transferred to a high-security prison, they would have to act quickly. The prisoners were randomly assigned to exercise periods in an effort to thwart any plans for escape. Biggs enlisted the help of two fellow convicts, and when they were finally all together in the yard, the plan was on. The prisoners were an effective decoy, allowing Biggs to make it over the wall. Like the robbery, the escape relied on shrewd planning and split-second timing. After only a year and a half in prison, Biggs was a free man again. Using proceeds from the robbery, he went to Paris and had plastic surgery. Under the cover of a new identity, Biggs disappeared. Only a few years later, Bruce Reynolds' luck ran out. 
Five years after the robbery, Scotland Yard had finally snared the gang's ringleader. Now the focus was on Biggs. The manhunt led them to Australia. Scotland Yard spent months chasing leads, but Biggs kept one step ahead of the law. Persuading a friend to lend him his passport, Biggs traveled to Brazil. Biggs lived in Rio de Janeiro under an assumed name for four years. The money from the robbery now spent, he needed to cash in on his exploits. He persuaded the Daily Express, a British newspaper, to buy his incredible story. The brazen Biggs now, in essence, was soliciting all of England to fund his life on the lamb. Jack Slipper learnt from a journalist called Mackenzie, or through a journalist called Mackenzie, who was writing a life of Ronald Biggs, that Biggs was now in Rio. He went out with a warrant for his arrest. Slipper left for Brazil to bring back the man who had eluded authorities for nine years. He kept observation on that hotel for many hours, and at uh, 12 o'clock, or just after 12 on Friday, uh, I saw Biggs enter the hotel. Slipper arrested Biggs at the Hotel Trocadero and was about to take him back to England when Biggs found a way to stop him. His girlfriend, Raimunda, who was an exotic dancer, rather an exotic figure, announced that she was pregnant. Brazil has a law that the parent of a Brazilian citizen may not be extradited. They must stay and try and support their child. Slipper returned to England empty-handed. Once again, Biggs had evaded capture. For Biggs, his years in hiding were over. He was now officially protected by the Brazilian government. The petty crook, now considered a folk hero, became one of Rio's tourist attractions. In 1993, retired Chief Superintendent Slipper, the man who had tried to bring him to justice, was reunited with Biggs in a media event staged by the Daily Express. Biggs will never come back on his own steam. He's got 28 years of prison still outstanding. And at his age, he's now 69. If he does come back on his own steam, there's only one place for him, that's Wandsworth Prison. While Ronald Biggs eluded authorities, most of the gang paid dearly for this crime of the century. The majority served 10 years hard time before making parole. The great train robbery, though cunning in its conception and daring in its execution, ended in disaster for nearly everyone involved. <laughs>